the Tudor Black Bay Pro, a GMT that has been looked at with equal amounts of affection and disdain. Is it an homage watch? Is it original? Is its diameter perfect? Is its case too thick? Is it a lazy design or is it just right? I have a strange connection with this watch. For the longest time, longer than I can even remember, I have wanted to see how Tudor would interpret the Explorer 2 design and aesthetic. And what's funny to think is that virtually every watch brand out there today has tried their own way to capture the magic of the legendary Orange Hand. But the one brand that essentially has partial ownership of the Orange Hand property with its link to Rolex is also one of the last to implement the design. But now that it's here and the dust has settled and we've all calmed down, taken a step back and had a look at it more, I kind of like it. The concept of stripping down a watch to its core essentials and doing away with the superfluous is always endearing. Now in this video I want to take a more critical look at the Pro, discuss briefly about the history of the Explorer 2 design and how it evolved to where it is today, and ask the question if this new release was addressed well, of course adding a small redesign at the end. I have grown fond of Tudor as a brand, I would say over the last 12 months, to such an extent that I now own one of their watches, which I look forward to revealing and sharing, I think in the next video about the brand. And I must say it's, it's been the one watch I've worn the most this year. Like I've barely taken it off. And that's a testament to how well made these pieces are. There's a lot to cover. And I think this watch in a way reflects my feelings about the brand and about the watch that I picked up. The last time I spoke about the watch, there was many discussion in the comments about what the watch could be. Could easily be a Black Bay, maybe not. Another small thing is that Dave in the comments has asked about what watch I wear in these videos. And I think it's a great thing to just share. If anyone out there might be interested, I'll talk about the watch that I'm wearing as a part of the presentation before getting into the meat of it. It's sacrilegious when talking about a Tudor watch to be wearing an Omega, but I absolutely adore this watch. I think they hit it out of the park and it still remains so relevant today, even though it's seen as quite a sleeper. So there's a hint of nostalgia to this broad arrow design that I always find so captivating. To understand the Black Bay Pro, we have to briefly look at the 1655 Explorer 2, which is an incredible watch. It is so odd, so peculiar, one of the most interesting sports models that Rolex has ever produced. You know, it is an ugly duckling that never received the fanfare when it was released. Its early existence was very much the same as the Daytona. Most stores couldn't give these away. And that's primarily because the Datejust, Submariners, Oyster Perpetuals, GMTs were the hot topic because they offered a lot of variants, because they were spoken about a lot, because they were worn by a lot of people, because they got the most amount of positive press. The reason why this Explorer 2 wasn't appreciated as much is because of the marketing associated with it. A watch built for cave exploring. I mean, really? How many people in the world do that? Though we look back at this watch today with rose-tinted glasses, there were drawbacks to this design back then. The GMT hand was not independent, so it only functioned as a day-night indicator, which is pretty useless. It's great if you're a hermit or if you actually venture into caves. It's very practical down there. So what makes the 1655 so special? Why does it have this pop culture status and so many different affiliations today? Well, there's quite literally nothing else like it. Take a 1675 GMT case, slap on a steel bezel and call it a day. It has this blend of function and complexity with a twist of 70s motifs, borrowing elements like a racing railroad track, a broad triangle with corresponding rectangles on the dial to communicate that it's a Rolex professional model, stark contrast between the markers, the plots, the hands, of varying line weights and thicknesses. So while it is complex, it is also legible. But what is endearing about the 1655 model that most enthusiasts don't see was that the conception of this watch, this strange arrangement of components that we look at today and scratch our heads, this was all done deliberately. It was designed with a single purpose in mind and for the most part, does it brilliantly. The steel bezel, a harder material next to aluminium was chosen because if the bezel was scratched, it would affect the function of the watch. Since the bezel couldn't be loomed, the dial instead was loomed at every point where the hour would be read on the bezel. This was a great idea, in theory. Definitely not easy for the wearer to understand. The modern Explorer 2 has come quite a long way since the original. And on one hand, I find it quite sad that it hasn't stuck to the roots of what made it special. In fact, it's one of the only professional Rolex models to ever see such a dynamic shift away from its original purpose. Where it once had this incredibly unique dial and handset to the Rolex line, it's now a fixed bezel GMT master with an orange hand. Now, of course, there's argument to be made that the original design of the dial ended up being far too complex for its own good. 
and removing this clutter from it made it far more functional and purposeful. Regardless, this simplified dial is the way that the Explorer 2 is seen today. Moving from Rolex, we can now discuss the attitude towards Tudor today. It is still seen as an homage watch brand in some circles. A lot are saying, and this is understandable, that they can't seem to move away from imitating Rolex models. And this is done on purpose. Since we now can't get our hands on professional Rolex models, we look to Tudor, which offer us more affordable variations that also do have a draw from its own past. But where this term homage is relevant is when we look at the Black Bay line, arguably one of the most successful watches of this past decade. And it can be seen today as one of the most successful watches to have ever been made. Let that sink in. It needs to be said that Tudor also has amazing original designs of their own, like the Pelagos, like the North Flag, the Heritage Chronograph Collection. The Black Bay, since it was established in 2012, has always taken center stage, and a lot of these more original designs have been pushed into the background. But the true lightning in a bottle moment was the release of the Black Bay 58. Pulling inspiration from an original classic model, creating a piece with size and proportions as its priority, and essentially creating an iconic Submariner that anybody could own. It's a flawless proposition. What makes it even better is that there are small motifs that divide it away from the more typical modern watch that we see today, with gilt lettering, gilt handset, a red accent to the bezel, a big crown, no crown guards, a bracelet with a female end link with rivets, and let's not forget the polished chamfers at the edges of the case. So since the Black Bay has been seen as such a success and has evolved into the brand's core property, you don't have to look at the statistics to know that the Black Bay is their best seller. Naturally then, anything associated with the Black Bay name will get attention. So the Black Bay Pro, kind of an expected release, all things considered. Tudor did have a lot on their hands with a model like this. How do you integrate a GMT into the collection that doesn't affect or impact the current 41 mm GMTs while still keeping it relevant and tied to the Black Bay line. It's not as easy as you would think, because naturally we all wanted a 39mm Black Bay 58 GMT. But I mean, realistically, it's going to drive so much attention away from the earlier 41mm. It is almost a safer proposition to bring out a 39mm GMT with a turning bezel. The name divides opinion. Some think Pro sounds like an Apple product. And I would agree, it should have been called Professional or Safari or Jewel Time, something with a bit more zing. But what this watch does communicate without question is professional. I would even go so far to say that it looks more professional than current Rolex Explorer 2 models. And stripping down the glitz is what Tudor has become very good at. Something I will talk more about when discussing my new watch. Less highly reflective surfaces, an emphasis on the knurling on the watch's crown, a sense of stealth to its presentation, what has made a great splash is the sizing of this watch, 39mm in diameter with those golden proportions. But it also gives off this distinct impression that it is a watch that is made to be used. What makes the Explorer watch so favoured is that it is built to be beaten up. A full steel construction that is made to be used in rugged conditions. And it's also clearly noticeable that Tudor as a brand likes Wabi Sabi. They like the idea of introducing watches with bronze finishes. Unlike the big brother who prefers polished edges and refined finishing, Tudor, on the other hand, wants their watches to display their scars. The benefits of an all-steel finish is the subtlety, the versatility. It's not eye-catching. I think it needs to be said that there is this great element of stealth associated with the Black Bay Pro. It doesn't look like your typical dive watch or your typical traveler's watch. So what we have is a 70s-inspired design with an exterior that looks more linked to the 1950s. There is no denying that this is a safe design. I wish it did away with the rivets on the bracelet to bring across this professional look, but what I do like most about the Pro is that it doesn't come across looking like a neutered Black Bay. It is a piece that does manage to stand on its own two feet, and if we weren't inundated with so many orange hand GMT models with fixed bezels today, this would look fresh. Another thing that I never thought I would say with a dial like this is that the snowflake hands really work with this arrangement. The square elements countering these circular plots. Even the mild tapering to the GMT hand looks good, it mirrors the running second hand. Some are asking why the plot was shifted so far back. I think it was done to mirror the triangle hand in a way, but moving it back also means that it doesn't interfere with the plots on the dial or the handset. It was neatly done and well arranged. But let's cut to the chase. We as enthusiasts are spoilt. There is so much variety catering for virtually any niche we can think of. 
When we see a design that mirrors elements that belongs to virtually every other black bay, we would naturally jump to the conclusion that it is a lazy design. But for those who have never seen this piece before, it comes across as fresh. The Pro, though it looks like virtually every other black bay, has a new case, a new dial, new handset, new plots, new bezel, new crown, new clasp. You see what I mean? There is a lot of criticism around the case thickness of this watch, even though it is the same as the 41mm GMT. And it does boil down to getting one of these on the wrist to experience it, to see whether or not you're okay with the thickness. But there is a considerable difference between the Pro and the Black Bay 58. So is this an homage or not? There's been a lot of talk about how brands like Steinhardt create better reproductions of the 1655 next to this. It is very easy to bring back a design from the past, but it's not easy to inject your own DNA into a product and have it come across as fresh. There are some brilliant interpretations of Orange Hand GMTs. The micro brand scene is full of them. The nicest thing I could say about the Pro is that I think it was an admirable effort, but I do wish a design like this existed in the Pelagos collection. If you've ever seen a Pelagos without a rotating bezel, you will know what I mean. Plus, a full titanium case and bracelet attached to this watch would be incredible. But instead of waxing lyrical about how I would want to see the Pelagos used as the template, what they could have done with this watch better, and something that I wish they had done, was to make the 12, the 9 and the 6 markers bigger. This would mirror the 1655 design better, but also keep it looking like a black bay. Plus, it would also have it stand out more in this collection when we look across to the GMT and to the divers. The overarching question that everyone's asking, is this watch brilliant or lazy? I see it as a bit of both. And though we look at it externally and we see so many things that are repeated that belong to the black bay collection, there was a lot of attention to detail added in this piece. Everything from the boxed crystal to the color of the date window to the color of the plots and the handset. The added knurling on the crown making it easier to grip. It doesn't come across as your typical black bay with polished surrounds, a rotating bezel. It also, for the first time, doesn't have an affiliation with the Submariner or the GMT, but rather the Explorer. And like I said in the beginning, there is a level of understatedness and subtlety that'll make this watch great anywhere you take it. We could say, therefore, that the Black Bay Pro could be seen as the most tool-oriented Black Bay that has ever been released. A watch like this is not built to be respected, but rather built to be used. It's a piece that you can throw on, enjoy the micro adjustments, know that it won't attract attention, and wear it in virtually all situations without compromise. Whether this watch or its design manages to stand the test of time remains to be seen. But I will say that after some careful consideration, that it is a watch that I somehow like far more than I ever thought I would.